Hey everybody, well, this is Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We want to welcome you today to our YouTube channel here as we are uh, coming to you this afternoon with the midweek message. I'm recording this on the afternoon of Wednesday, November 3rd, and I'll be releasing this on Thursday morning of November 4th. <clears throat> as always, want to welcome you to our YouTube channel here. If you haven't already done so, if you'd consider subscribing and ringing the alarm bell here so that you can stay current with the ministry, as we produce content, uh, both from the assembly building on Sunday morning and then also midweek in these studies right here. And also we've been re-releasing starting this week. I started re-releasing. That sun is not in a good spot there. We've been re-releasing the Grace History Project. Uh, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday morning, we'll be releasing one at 9 a.m. Eastern Time. So you're going to want to subscribe and ring the alarm bell so that you can stay current with all of that content that we're going to be producing midweek. All right, had to get rid of that sun problem there. So the sun's not in my eyes. So again, stay current. Make sure you ring the alarm bell here. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Our featured book for the month of November is my book, Rightly Dividing E.W. Bollinger, Assessing His Life, Ministry, and Impact. And this book is about the life and times of Bollinger and with a specific focus on the origin of the Acts 28 dispensational position and how that came into existence and what Bollinger's role was in that, as well as what he had to say about the postscript theory about Romans chapter 16, verses 25 and 26, that then uh, factors into the whole idea of when... Uh, that was written and what impact it has on the dispensational position of the book of Romans. So you're going to want to get this book. You're going to want to check this book out, Rightly Dividing E.W. Bollinger, Assessing His Life, Ministry, and Impact. You can pick the book up and help support the ministry here as well. And as always, we also want to remind everybody about our Rumble channel, Grace Life Bible Church here on Rumble. We're up to 150 subscribers. We started out with nothing at the beginning of this year of 2021. And we're up to 150 subscribers. So we've established this as an alt tech site should something happen to our YouTube ministry. So you're going to want to come over and uh, subscribe here and check us out on Rumble as well. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, what I have been doing here starting this week, the first week of November 2021, is I have been re-releasing the Grace History Project. And I have created a playlist on the church's YouTube channel here for this. So I, what I'm doing is I'm releasing three videos a week, one on Monday, Wednesday, Friday mornings at 9 a.m. Those are set to premiere. They have a live chat feature for those of you that want to discuss what you're uh, learning or what you're hearing about. I'm not always able to be in the chat myself because I'm teaching uh, a class at school at that time. And so um, I try to set those things up so that they can premiere automatically without me having to be directly involved. So listen, if you if you want to study church history from the point of view of mid-Acts Pauline dispensationalism and the Pauline perspective, I really strongly encourage you to check out the Grace History Project, Tracing the Abandonment and Resurgence of Pauline Truth from Paul to the Present. So this is going to be an ongoing thing. Every week, there'll be three videos released, Monday, Wednesday, Friday mornings, 9 a.m., until we've exhausted the entire class, which is something like 168 videos. But we go through church history from the point of view of Pauline Truth. So please sign up on our channel. Make sure that you subscribe and ring the alarm bell so that you can stay current with all this content. And then as we work our way through this, this playlist will continue to populate with these various messages as we, as we uh, go through this. So what I want to talk about today, what I want to talk about today is... Something that I'm calling, What a Difference a Day Makes, a Practical Lesson on the Need to Rightly Divide the Word of Truth. What a Difference a Day Makes, a Practical Lesson on the Need to Rightly Divide the Word of Truth. So we have in front of us here, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, which if you're familiar with this channel at all, you've, you've uh, no doubt heard me talk about this before. Um, so it's not going to be anything new, but the verse says, Study. To show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So here at Grace Life Bible Church, we do believe in the issue of right division, the issue of rightly dividing the word of truth, or put another way, dispensational Bible study. The need to recognize the distinctives that God has placed within his word, 
that they need to be recognized and adhered to when studying the Bible. And um, all of its truth, the whole Bible, the entire Word of God, it's all true. We're not dividing truth from error here in this verse. We're rightly dividing the Word of truth. We're going into the Word of truth, and we're identifying that God said different things to different people at different times, okay? And then we're seeking to accurately apply those distinctions and those divisions to the word of truth so as to accurately understand it and so as to be approved uh, workmen that needeth not to be ashamed, approved unto God workmen that needeth not to be ashamed. Now, what I want to do is I want to actually go back to the Old Testament. I want to kind of give an object lesson in this video of why, using an example from the history of the nation of Israel, of why we need to rightly divide the word of truth. And what I've chosen to do for this video is we want to look at Numbers chapter 13 and Numbers chapter 14 and look at the situation that happened with Israel and Kadesh Barnea in time past as they've been, uh, as the nation has been, you know, born out of Egyptian slavery. God's taken them through the Red Sea. He's given them the Ten Commandments and the law and so forth there on Mount Sinai. And he's brought them to the precipice of here of entering into the promised land, the land promised to Abraham and the fathers of Israel, etc., and so the spies are sent in, and the spies have come back now, and we're going to pick this up right here at Numbers 13, verse 25, where the spies are going to give their report, okay? So verse 25, and they returned from searching from searching of the land after 40 days, and went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to the congregation of children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh. And brought back word unto them, unto all the congregation, and showed them the fruit of the land. So they've been in there for 40 days, and they've been checking it out, and now they've come back. Verse 27. And they told him and said, We came unto the land, whither thou sentest, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. So it's a totally accurate report that the land, the promised land, was filled, the land of Canaan was filled with milk, flowed with milk and honey. Okay, So that's that's their testimony. But then look at this, verse 28. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it. So Caleb says, Forget all that. Let's go up there and let's possess it. Now watch. For we are for we for we are well able to overcome it. So Caleb believes in the promise of God. That God has promised them the land. He's like, look it, there's nothing here that's of any issue for us. Let's just go up and possess it. Let's go take it, our possession. Watch. But men, but the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against this people, for they are stronger than we. So they're going to gainsay the situation here. Caleb is like, let's go possess it. And these guys are going to say, no, it's too hard. They're stronger than we are. We're not going to be able to do it. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched under the children of Israel, saying, The land... Uh, through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of the sons of Anak, which can, which come of the giants, and we were in their sight as grasshoppers, so were we in their sight. So notice, Caleb wants to go and possess it. It's our possession. Let's go take it. We can overcome it. We're able to do it. And he wants to act by faith in what God said. This is the promise of God uh, to the nation of Israel through the patriarchs, uh, Abraham, etc. And he's like, let's go take it. And then these other guys bring up an evil report. They bring up an evil report of the land. And they want to gainsay the land. And they say, it's too hard. They're of great stature. We're not going to win. And so there's this evil report that is given. Now, if we come over to chapter 14, if we go to the next chapter, we'll see the response of the people starting in verse 1, uh, Numbers chapter 14, verse 1. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. Now watch. And the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in the wilderness? So 
the murmuring starts immediately, and we're in the middle of a hist of a history here and a story with the nation of Israel, and they've been murmuring the whole time. Okay, so they're like, it's better that we had just died in slavery in Egypt. It's better that we had died in the wilderness. Look at the next verse. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, and that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? So these guys immediately start murmuring. They start complaining. They said it'd be better for us if we had died. We'd be, we'd be better off if we just returned to Egypt. All right. Now, you know, it's easy for us to be hard on the Israelites here. This is sort of an aside. It's easy for us to be hard on them and say, how could they murmur? They saw the 10 plagues in Egypt. They saw God's deliverance. They saw the Red Sea. They said they saw God thundering to Moses there at Mount Sinai when the law was given, etc. And now here they are and they're complaining and they're murmuring. You know, I have to just say, we're not too much different, all right? And we like to cl complain and murmur, et cetera. And we like to do that probably more than we'd like to go to the Lord in prayer about things, if I'm just being honest. And I think if you're honest with yourself, you'll you'll realize that too, we're not that much different than the children of Israel in these ways. And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. They want to pick a captain and they want to go back to Egypt, all right? That's the attitude, that's the response of the people. So the people are responding by listening to the gainsaying, by listening to the evil report of those men that said it's too hard, we can't do it, uh, whereas grasshoppers, they're strong, et cetera, et cetera, so on and so forth, right? Now watch. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of whatever his name is, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. So Joshua and Caleb are mad. They're upset about the response of the people. They rent their clothes over this. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth in milk and honey. So Joshua and Caleb are, are exhorting the nation of Israel here to operate by faith. If this is the will of God, that they have the land, then the Lord will take care of it for us. He will bring us into the land and he's going to give it to them. So it's almost as if everyone else has forgotten again what happened. Only rebel not, verse 9, only rebel not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they, um, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. So these guys, Joshua and Caleb, they want to operate by faith. They want to do what God said. They're trusting the Lord. And they know that if they trust in the Lord and the Lord's uh, with them, who's going to oppose them? <clears throat> but all the congregation bade stone them with stones. Seriously, the two guys that are advocating for operating and walking by faith, the rest of the congregation of Israel wants to throw them, with, wants to stone them, wants to kill them for saying, let's operate on the basis of faith and let's go in and possess the land. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones and the glory of the Lord and appear in the tabernacle of the congregation before the children of Israel. Verse 11. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will they be, and how long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them. That's what I was talking about a minute ago, right? God's like, listen. How long do I have to put up with these guys? How long are they going to provoke me? How long do I have to deal with their unbelief? Think of all, look at all the signs that I've showed them this entire time. From, from, from the moment I sent Moses into Egypt to lead him out of Egypt, God's done sign after sign after sign after sign for this people. Okay. Now look at God's response. I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them. And will make thee a greater nation and might make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. God is so frustrated with Israel here that he says to Moses, Let me tell you what we're going to do, Moses. Let's start over. I'll take you, Moses. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And in doing that, this nation that I'll make out of you is going to be mightier. It's going to be greater. It's going to be better than this group of people. Now watch what Moses says. And Moses said unto the Lord, Then the Egyptians shall hear it. 
for thou broughtest up this people in thy might from among them. Moses, Moses is going to ultimately say, you can't do that. If you do that, what are the Egyptians going to say? You brought this whole nation out of here to this point. If you do this, what are the Egyptians going to say? Verse, verse uh, 14. And they will tell it to the inhabitants of the land. For they have heard that thou, Lord, art among this people, that thou, Lord, art, art seen face to face, that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by, by day in a pillar of a cloud and in a pillar of fire by night. Now if thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land, which he sware unto them, therefore he hath slain them in the wilderness. What's Moses' argument? Moses' argument is, you can't do this, Lord, because what are the nations going to say? You brought them up here, and then you're not able to bring them into the land. What are the nations going to say about this? Okay. And oh, by the way, look at this, the land which he sware unto them. Moses is pleading Israel's cause on the basis of God's word. God is ultimately not going to be able to do this because God has total and complete integrity to his word, to what he already said. Did he say that he was going to use Abraham and Abraham's seed? Did he say he was going to use the seed of Isaac and the seed of Jacob, etc., and that he was going to bless the earth through them? Now God is upset with the unbelief of Israel. He says, listen, Moses, I'm going to kill them all. We'll start over with you. We'll make a greater and a mightier nation. And Moses says, you can't do that. And you can't do it for two reasons. Number one, what are these nations going to say? You weren't able to do it. And number two, you swear unto them that you were going to do this. You can't do this. You can't break your word. I find that to be a fascinating and powerful testimony to God's integrity to his word. In Titus chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says, God who cannot lie. God cannot break his covenant vow that he made to the nation of Israel. And Moses reminds God here in this passage, in this context, of what God said to this nation. Now watch Moses. Now I beseech thee, let the power of the Lord be great according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations. Watch, pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people according to thy, according to the greatness of thy mercy, as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. Moses is pleading on the basis, he's beseeching the Lord, as it says here in verse 17. You know, it's an interesting point. I just preached in the, our conference a couple weeks ago on the book of Philemon, where Paul beseeches Philemon on behalf of Onesimus. And I said in that message that in the Old Testament, you see men beseeching other men. You see men beseeching God, but you never have God beseeching men like we see in Paul's epistles. That's a whole other topic for a different day. I'll put a link to that message here in the description for this video. But Moses is beseeching the Lord on behalf of the nation of Israel that he pardon them that he exercise long-suffering and mercy and forgive their iniquity and forgive their, their transgression, etc., and to pardon them. He's beseeching them on the basis of the great mercy of God to forgive them as he already had been from Egypt until now, until the moment that this event is occurring. So Moses beseeches the Lord on behalf of Israel that he not destroy them, that he not start over. Now look at the Lord's response. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. God acknowledges the truthfulness of Moses' beseeching. But he's still going to punish him. This is the justice of God now. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land wherein he went, and his seed shall possess it. 
Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwelt in the valley. Tomorrow turn ye and get ye into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. So God says, the, God says, Caleb can see it. The rest of these jokers can't see it. Tomorrow, now that's key. Tomorrow, turn you and get into the wilderness. So here is my point, and here's why I was talking about right division and using this as a practical example. On day one, God's instruction was for them to go in and possess the land. Joshua and Caleb said, let's do it. The Lord's with us. He'll give it to us. The rest of the nation listens to the evil report. They gainsay the land. They whine, cry, murmur, and complain. And so as a result, God is saying, I'm going to judge this nation, and I'm going to judge them by not letting all these folks see the land that, that did not operate and walk by faith. Tomorrow, so that would be day two. What's the instruction now? The instruction is to turn and get you into the wilderness by way of the Red Sea. So have the instructions changed? What was true on day one is not going to be true on day two. Because God changed? No, but because of the unbelief of the nation of Israel. Verse 26, And the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel which they murmur against me. Say unto them, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do. Your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to the whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me. So everyone twenty and up is going to be uh, perishing here in the wilderness. Doubtless ye shall not come into the land, concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb, the son of whatever his name is, and Joshua, the son of Nun. But your little ones, which ye said, shall be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. Okay? But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in the wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years, and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. And after the number of days in which ye searched the land, even forty days, each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities, even forty years, and ye shall be my, uh, and ye shall know my breach of promise. So God is God is definitely serious here. He told them in His Word. Now think about the way God's acting here. God wants to start over, destroy all of them, start over with Moses. Moses says you can't do that because you swore unto this people, and because you swore unto this people, what are these nations going to say about you? So God now is giving them justly, exactly according to the parameters of how they behaved. Okay, I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it unto all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me in the wilderness. They shall be consumed, and there they shall die. And the men which Moses sent to search the land, whom returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him by bringing up a slander unto the land, even those men that did bring up the evil report unto the land died by the plague before the Lord. Now, I take that statement in verse 37 to mean that they died immediately. They're basically struck dead because of the evil that they, the evil report that they gave. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of whatever his name is, which were of the men that went to search the land, lived still. So it's very clear to me that these guys in verse 37, they died. They're instantaneously sickened and they die as direct punishment okay so verse 39 we're almost done verse 39 and moses told these sayings unto the children of israel and the people mourned greatly okay so day one the report comes in the, the two spy the ten spies murmur against the land Caleb and Joshua, they give the evil report. They murmur against the land. They cause the children of Israel to murmur. They cause them to blame God and would that we would die in the wilderness. And they're going to they're going to elect a captain to lead him back to Egypt, etc. And then God, in his in his justice, he's going to come now and and he says, "You guys are not going to see the land." Okay. 
The 10 guys that gave the evil report die immediately. The rest of them are going to wander. Tw everyone over 20 years old is going to die in the wilderness. And the children 20 and younger, or younger excuse me, are going to be the ones that see the land, right? All that happens on day one. Now look at day two. And they rose up early in the morning. So this is day two. And they rose up early in the morning and got them up into the top of the mountain saying, Lo, we be here and will go unto the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. So now it's day two. It's the morning of day two. And on the morning of day two, they want to go back and claim the promise of day one. The promise of day one was the land is ours. The Lord is with us. We can take it just like Joshua and Caleb said, right? But now it's the morning of day two. God said, you're all going to die in the wilderness. And now they're on the morning of day two, they go up to the spot and they want to act on the basis of what the instruction was the day before. And Moses said, wherefore now do ye transgress the commandment of the Lord, but it shall not prosper. Moses says, what in the world are you guys doing? God changed the commandment. Day one, he changed the commandment. Now here they are on day two and they want to go up and ap operate on the basis of the commandment of day one. But God has changed the commandment. He's changed the instruction. He's changed the expectation, not because God changed, but because they had unbelief. And now here they are on day two and they want to operate on the basis of the promise of day one. Go, verse 42, go not up, for the Lord is not among you, that ye be not smitten before your enemies. The Lord's not with them on day two. On day one, he would have gone up and absolutely given them the land if they would have operated and walked by faith. But now on day two, he's not with them. Why? Because he changed the instructions. So here you got a bunch of Israelites on day two trying to operate the instructions on day one. And you know what? They're going to go out on day two and they're going to be absolutely slaughtered because that's not what God was doing anymore now on day two. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and ye shall fall by the sword because ye are turned away, because ye are turned away from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord will not be with you. What do they do? They listen to the new instruction? Do they heed the new commandment? Do they do what God is saying and telling them to do on day two? Nope. We're going to go back and we're going to do what the instructions were on day one, and they do it to their own peril, to their own destruction. Verse 44, but they presume to go up unto the hilltop. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. Then the Amalekites came down and the Canaanites, which dwelt in the hill, and smote them and discomforted them unto Hormah. On day two, they're trying to operate on the instructions from day one. How'd it go? It didn't go very well. Now, here's the point. Many believers today, many members of the church, the body of Christ today, are trying to operate in Israel's instructions. They're trying to operate in what God said to Israel in time past, be it in the Old Testament or be it in Matthew uh, through John, and they're trying to claim promises, and they're trying to take things that God said to the nation of Israel, and they're trying to get them to work today, and it's not working, and they're getting frustrated, they're getting upset. Some of them are even departing the faith. They're leaving altogether because they can't make sense. They can't make heads or tails of the Word of God because they're not rightly dividing the Word of truth. They're not approaching the Scriptures dispensationally. I mean, Paul says in Romans chapter... Um, Romans 16, verse 25, he talks about, Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret. And then Peter in Acts 3, he's talking about all the prophets had spoken since the world began. Is there a difference between that which was kept secret since the world began, the mystery, the body of doctrine and truth committed to the Apostle Paul, and that which was, has been made known since the world began through the prophetic scriptures? The answer is yes, there is. But see, here is the object lesson. There are people today that are trying to operate in day two based upon the instructions on day one. Did it make all the difference in the world for Israel what day it was and which instructions they were trying to follow? So let's learn a lesson here about this from looking at the history of the nation of Israel. Looking at 
what a difference a day makes. And here we're talking about two 24-hour periods. God said A on day one. He changed. He said he said B on day two. And on day two, they go out and they try to operate on the basis of day one instructions to their utter peril and demise. Now, listen, we're in the dispensation of grace and God's not going to smote you. He's not going to smite you. He's not going to, you know, physically attack you and imperil you and all these sorts of things. But you will suffer in your spiritual walk and your spiritual life if you're confused. If you don't understand who you are as a member of the body of Christ, if you don't understand that as a member of the church of the body of Christ, you're not the nation of Israel. So I'd encourage you, seek out teaching that explains the word of God dispensationally, that follows Paul's instruction to rightly divide the word of truth. And see here in Numbers 13 and 14 an object lesson, a lesson about the need, the absolute need, to rightly divide the word of truth. It'll make a difference in your life. It'll make a difference in your life practically. See, do, practice follows doctrine. And if you don't understand who and what you are, you have a very hard time operating by faith. And so I'd encourage you to consider the story here as an example of the absolute need and necessity to rightly divide the word of truth. Even Israel had to do this. Even Israel had to understand. And the people that didn't follow the most recent instruction on day two, they went out and they were destroyed because they were trying to function in light of what God had said on day one. I hope that makes sense to you. I hope that you can uh, wrap your mind around that. If you have any questions, uh, make sure to, to leave something in the, in, the, uh, in the comments there. Make sure you also, again, you, you make sure to, to subscribe, guys, and, and ring the alarm bell. we got a lot of things going on here on our channel with the re-airing, the rebroadcasting of the Grace History Project. And then also on when, on Sunday mornings, guys, at 9 o'clock, I'm going live from the church teaching a very long study on the issue of preservation of Scripture. And right now we're in the point in history where we're talking about the King James Bible itself and the process that was followed that resulted in the King James Bible. There's research in here that I guarantee you you've not heard presented before. You need to check it out if you're at all interested in that topic. I also want to remind you about our uh, podcast that my wife and I have started, the Just Grace It podcast with Brian and Becky Ross. As November uh, gets set in here, we hope to be able to resume our schedule on that podcast. Please check that out if you haven't already done so. We're on Spotify and also on iTunes. And then don't forget about our Rumble channel here, Grace Life Bible Church on Rumble. And again, if you want to support, help support the ministry, please consider picking up a copy of my book, Rightly Dividing E.W. Bollinger, Assessing His Life, Ministry, and Impact. And last, don't forget about gracelifebiblechurch.com. We have tons of information on this website. We've got information about the King James Bible. We have links to all the videos that I've done on these midweek. We have all our entire school of theology our adult Sunday school uh, materials here, different courses, mini lessons, links to the Bible conference. We've got a ton of information here. And also, don't miss the Right Division 101 series. I'm going to put a description to that in this video as well. And listen, before you go, let me, let me just say, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ, if you've never relied on his death upon the cross, his shed blood for your sins, his burial and his resurrection from the dead as the only total complete payment for your sin, Trust him today. Believe that he died for you and that he rose again. And when you do, you receive eternal life as a free gift. You don't have to go through any religious hocus pocus or mumbo jumbo. Just in your heart, believe and acknowledge your sin and acknowledge the fact that Christ died for your sin, was buried and rose again. And when you believe that simple message, you'll receive eternal life as a free gift. You'll be sealed by God the Holy Spirit under the day of redemption, and you'll be translated out from under the power of darkness and into the kingdom of his dear son. Trust Jesus Christ today before it's everlasting too late. Thanks for your time. See you next time.